Mark was also supposed to be with us, Brett, but uh, you've had a tragedy in the family, so he's, he's off to the funeral. But thank you for coming. Thank you very much for having me. And we've got a lot to talk about in uh, not just the financial results, but why I like Blue Label so much. And I think there's a lot of other people, the analysts, um, who are now starting to see greater attractions in the Blue Label stock. Uh, we're going to go straight into it. There are we do have the facility to make this as interactive as possible, so while you're listening, if you'd like to post questions, just go for it. Uh, we've got Stuart who's sitting at HQ at uh, Standard Bank Online Share Trading, and he'll be picking up the questions and uh, putting them into a little box that I'll see here from Biz News, and then we'll pose them to Brett. So I'll carry on with it, uh, and as the questions start coming through, we'll, we'll uh, bring those through as well. We are scheduled to carry on for an hour. We'll see how it goes. We uh, perhaps will continue for that long. We might not do it as long. Whatever. We'll just see how the conversation goes. But there's, gee, Brett, there's, uh, there's enough going on in your company to keep us here for six hours. <laughs> All right. Let's go on to the first of the, uh, of the slides. And I think that's, uh, there we go. That's the share price. If we go back to November 2007, when you guys listed, you came to the market at a price of 675. The shares shot the lights out on day one. A um, couple of few days later, they got to an all-time high, which well, which stood until recently, and then then it slid down. Let's just go back a little bit. When you list a company as you did, I mean, you're 40 years old now. Have you turned 40 yet? Not yet. You're just about 40 though. Four months time. Four months time. Okay. In uh, seven years ago, you were in your early 30s, and you decided to take this company to market. It was in the boom of 2007. There was a lot of excitement around it. Did you, looking back, maybe overprice the shares at the time? I think just to put it into perspective, just to go back to the time, we were pricing the listing at 5 Rand 50 to 6 Rand 75, 675 obviously being the high. And about a week before we listed, Microsoft decided to come into our listing. So as soon as the market heard that Microsoft were coming into our listing, we became 10, 11 times oversubscribed at the 6 Rand 75 mark. Why did they want to come in? They really had a great, uh, they wanted to take their product to the prepaid independent world, actually, and they had headhunted us, quite strangely, that uh, they picked this company in South Africa called Blue Label. We weren't listed at the time, so our exposure was already around the world. And really what their whole idea to do was to take products like Microsoft, Windows, etc., put it into a prepaid format and offered into cloud base into the market where today we know of cloud and it's very popular but in 2007 obviously something new and our partnership uh, really good unfortunately ended around about 2010, 2011 but on really good terms and that was just because Microsoft really the machine it is couldn't deliver on the a new market for them, basically. Mm. But if we take your share price down to 2008, that's not unusual. What happened in the market generally was a, a, a lot of excitement in 2007 and then a, a bit of a bust uh, after the global financial crisis hit. All shares all over the world uh, were affected, including yours. Yes, yeah, so we were, I think if I stand to be corrected, in 2007, there were two more up days until the bubble actually hit after the 14th of November. And then, of course, we went into this massive crash of 2008, where I think everyone was, uh, was affected equally. I think everyone on the downside affected equally, at least. And uh, weathered through it, you know. I think, uh, you know, we put our heads down, did what we had to do, traded, as you said, obviously, straight away at a much higher number and then came back. And ever since then, it's really just... Uh, I think the share price being secondary for us, uh, grinding away and making sure we deliver to the market and uh, I'm sure the share price will take care of itself in the future. I often hear CEOs saying exactly that, but actually you do watch the share price. Come on. I used to, and then it used to bother me so much I decided it's better for my heart not to watch it. Well, I remember Bernard Cantor after they listed Investec in, I think it was 1985, for a couple of years it did nothing uh, and he was so frustrated about it. And I think you could have bought the shares at two rand, two rand twenty. Of course, look at them today, and uh, and you'd know that uh, that's the time to be accumulating the stock. But just going back over those six years uh, to bring us back to you know back to present, 
things were going okay, and then towards the end of, or towards the middle of last year, falling quite sharply, the share price down to the eight rand level, and then you had the spike up to ten rand. That was around the time that you had an unsolicited bid. What went on there? So it was October of last year, the beginning of October. Uh, you know, blue label. Quite often we get a lot of interest or people looking at us. This time our board felt from a governance perspective that we needed to announce uh, that there was a suit to, to look at buying 100% of Blue Label. It's not out of the ordinary for Blue Label. This just took a bit of a different turn and that's why we had to announce it. I think very important to note is Mark and I are not sellers of the share. Management, we're really not looking for for a sale. This came left field if I can call it that entirely and through good governance we announced it at the end of it obviously the share price sparked up literally 10 percent in one day and then drove from there and at the end of it obviously fell through and we find ourselves actually trading at a little bit less than we did before the announcement so you know obviously the market you get the people who react to it what we call I guess punters in and out but our long-term shareholder base, I think, has remained. That's a very strong. You know, we've just uh, put our results, so we've seen quite a few of them, and I think uh, we're building up quite a solid base. What uh, stake do you and Mark have? Together, we got about just on 24 percent. Right. And you're not going anywhere. You were not prepared to sell. Was that the reason why the deal fell over? Not entirely. I think one. I think there's a lot of reasons why the deal fell through. But uh, I think very importantly is that any deal that comes to Blue Label, we would like to follow it. We would like to see a bigger picture for us, not necessarily financially, but uh, you know, we would really like to take this business into the future. So if it was a bigger company buying it, what role would we play in the bigger company? And uh, you know, one thing we do have on our side is age and uh, pretty young management around us. And I think we've got a lot to offer, so we're going to be around for a couple of years and I, I think that, that will be a good thing. Is that an advantage for a business like yours? I think so. One, because you really got people with heart and soul in the business. You got people with with big, uh, I guess, interest in the business from a shareholding. So, not that we look at it from a shareholder perspective, but you know, everything we do, we're doing in the best interest of shareholders because we do have a large shareholding and obviously have the shareholders' interest at heart. But I think more importantly, people who grew the business. So we were the drivers, we were the storemen, we were the salespeople, we've been absolutely everything in the business, so the knowledge is great. I think what we've really done well over the last five or six years, especially since we listed, is bringing what we call grey hair, a lot of good experience, especially on our board, a lot of good experience into management, a lot of diversity. I mean, from the original five, six people who started Blue Label, obviously the good thing is that remains, but everything around us is new. How many people you got now? If you exclude the call centers and exclude international, South Africa about 900 people. From five or six? From five or six. How many of them do you know? This is a sad part actually because I knew all of them and actually made a thing of going for lunch with mostly everyone. Now I try and make a point of going around the office and saying hello to everyone at least once a week. But the truth is I know a lot of faces and uh, finding it quite hard to keep up with all the names, unfortunately. Oh, 900, no one can blame you for that. Just, just to remind you, you can actually pose your questions to Brett uh, by uh, filling it in at the area where you can either go into the chat area or you can go to where the message area is. Okay, let's get into those numbers because the results were released last week. After talking to you and Mark on CNBC, I got quite excited about it because of the broader trend. And I think when you look at this, uh, what um, our attendees are seeing on the screen here, it's for the half year to the end of November. The gross profit is growing. The GP margin is growing. You're now at 7.6%. It's it's a whole lot more than selling cabbages at Shoprite, but it's not a it's not a massive margin. Is this a couple of percentage points, uh, or or even? tenths of a percentage points increase in your gross profit margin, I guess would have a big impact on the bottom line. Absolutely, because we work in our obviously massive revenues. If you impute what we call pinless revenue, you know the revenue that's going through our books currently is about 40, 45 billion rand. What we actually show is around about 20 billion. So any single point one, point two is massive. What's the difference between the two? 
One is what we call pinless top-ups, which means we act if you act as the agent and not the principal, or the principal and not the agent. So in essence, if the risk and rewards passes on to us, where we actually buy the stock, bring the stock into our side, and then release the stock, we then obviously bring in the revenue as well as the cost of sales itself. I'm sure a lot of people listening here have got a very good understanding of Blue Label, but for those who don't, for those who've just heard, hey, this is the stock that we should be looking at more closely, in a nutshell, what is it that you do? So the first thing that I really want to put out there is we list it as Blue Label Telecoms, but we're not a telecoms company, and I think it's really important to stress that because I think sometimes we get lost in what is happening in the telecoms world as such, and we're really not affected such as the, telecom, the telecoms companies are. But what we really are is a financial come distribution house where we will digitize anything and call it the prepaid ticketing world, and we will electronically move it across countries, move it across the world, and make sure that product can reach the masses of the world and not be limited to just urban areas. Explain that. Pay as you go. If I have a pay as you go phone, is it a blue label product that I'm going to buy from the cafe? So this is the most exciting part for me. And the, if if I can summarize blue label just quickly, it, it works like this. If I am the main guy, call it the Vodacom, the networks, the municipalities, the ESCOMs. They turned around after all these years and said, hang on guys, we got to be silly. Why don't we push more and more product into the prepaid world? We get paid upfront for product we're going to deliver in the future. Generally, we charge a little bit more for the service because there's not loyalty to it, so for the same service a bit more. And lastly, adding to the reason for it is zero bad debts because it's prepaid. So what is happening subconsciously is you see this massive draw from all the players at the top, more and more products into prepaid. They don't call it prepaid across the world especially because prepaid unfortunately is associated as a poor man's product. That's how it was developed initially. It's really not a poor man's product. It's a product for everyone. So what you see around the world is they call it pay as you go and so on and so forth. So what you see is this massive draw from the top end of more and more products going into prepaid. In the middle, you have the retailer, the merchant, who's turned around and said, hang on one second, how can this be? The most product that I'm selling out of my store is a product I hold no stock of. Imagine you went to people years ago and you said, listen, your number one SKU in your store is going to be a product you hold no stock of. Everyone would have thought you were a little bit crazy, which people did think Mark and I were a little bit crazy and probably still do. But you've got this massive pull from the merchant who's wanting more and more product in this prepaid virtual world because they're not holding any stock of it. Plus, they can hold products across the board. They can now compete on an equal footing. And lastly, bringing this prepaid world together is what is the customer. Because a customer, no matter where you are in the world, wants to budget their life. They want to know at the end of the month that this is what they're spending for X, Y, and Z. Mm. And no matter how hard you try in a postpaid world, it's impossible because you overspend on your electricity, you overspend on your internet. Well, the right. banks give us credit cards. I mean, don't blame the, the, exactly. <laughs> the human uh, no, no, consumption. You. We all the same. But it's interesting. If that's the case, then why aren't you really, really big in the online space? Because if it's to do with a retail, online has always had... Uh, virtual products, whereas the retailer has SKUs, as you said, you put a uh, tin of baked beans on your shelf. Is this not a massive opportunity? So the future online is massive. For us, we offer online services. Everything that we talk about, you can have online. Mm. The secret, what we're trying to do is take the product to the unbanked or the badly banked masses of a world, of a country. So. You know, when we started out, we said, hang on, how come a person who lives very rural doesn't want to call it shack insurance? They're, they do want shack insurance. The reason why they didn't have what we consider house insurance is, one, they couldn't get it, and two, if they could get it, it was too expensive for them to pay for it because they probably had to commute to do it. So what we're doing is we're taking product to the masses of the world. So you're a distribution company, not a, we, not a telecoms company. We absolutely a distribution company. Telecoms happens to be one of the products that we supply. So how do you grow as a distribution company? So as a distribution company, you've got to concentrate on two things. Number one is, of course, you have to continuously grow your distribution. 
And number two, the key to it all is once you grow this distribution, it's about sticking new products onto it because it's the Warren Buffett and uh, what he said, uh, actually read it a couple of months ago, about six, seven months ago. But he was in an interview and they said to him, why are you buying up all the railroads? He said, I'm going to give you three quick reasons. One, once the first railroad is built, there's no room for the second railroad. Secondly, no matter what you're in, there's always going to be a product that moves on my railroad from A to Z that will always move on it. And thirdly, if I want to maximize profit, I've built it, it's moving, all I've got to do is add carts onto the back. And that's really Blue Label. We're a virtual railroad. Once you have a system in your store, there's just no need for a separate system. There's nothing more it can do, there's nothing less it can do, or whatever. How, how big is your railroad? How many stores have you got? In South Africa, over 150,000. And what do they look like? They range from a pick and pay, shop right, checkers for argument's sake, look, all the way to a Shabin, Spaza shop, mom and pop, a merchant on the side of the road. It's really absolute vast, everything. And what does he get, that Shabin owner, for selling prepaid airtime to sell C that, that you've provided him with? So what First of all, we're doing for the independent market is we're giving them a chance to survive. And I think I need to explain that more because this is very important. If you don't take the independence, the mom and pops, the spaza shops, and you give them technical power, in a number of years they will diminish. You have these great big companies like ShopRite or Walmart who are really doing an unbelievable job by opening up on every corner, offering consumer champion stuff and really doing a good job. That if you don't give technical power to these stores, they can't compete on baked mm. beans or bread because they buy 10 loaves compared to a million. But if you give them technical power, they can have the exact same range of products as a ShopRite for argument's sake. They can sell at the same price, if not better, and therefore grow. And this is what you've seen in the Blue Label world. So what do we give them? We give them technical power through a hardware device which we're agnostic to. It doesn't have to be anything that's set. It's what's good for you as a store. How it connects must be good for you as a store, so it varies via satellite or via GPS or whatever it may be. What does it cost to install that? So we subsidize it for a lot, but it can cost anywhere from a thousand rand, the device installation, everything up to a freestanding vending machine which can cost 30 or 40,000 rand. And you find them where? Where do you find new outlets? Because uh, you know, 150,000 is a big chunk, one would presume, of the outlets that are available in South Africa to start. So 13% of our world is what you consider formal. Call it once again, just using them as names, but your shop rights, your pips, or your pick and pays. 87% of our world, which is really our world, is what we consider the independence. That's the, the mom and pop spaza shops. Now, there's millions of these stores. And they're popping up all the time. They pop up all the time. Oh. It, it all depends on the kind of device you can deliver from a cost point of view, but more importantly than the cost is the service point of view. So you've got to be able to uh, deliver different kinds of hardware devices with different kinds of service levels in order to make a, customer, a merchant of ours, who's a customer, do 2,000 Rand profitable the same as a customer does 100,000 Rand. And that's the balance of what you do. Brett, it, it's, it's quite a simple business model then. You get mass distribution and products that you put into that distribution chain. And, and clearly, as this uh, graph, if we look at that graph again, the gross profit, the GP margins, it's showing us that you're moving in the right direction, but there's got to be a balance. In the insurance industry, for instance, they know that it, the cost of acquisition can be higher than what they'll get back in, say, year one. But if they're doing a 20-year product in year two, three, four, uh, the, the, uh, a lot of that uh, margin goes straight to the bottom line. Is it similar with you? It is similar, but our weight is far shorter. Our, 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 uh, it changes, but it's between eight and ten months on a device. But remember, all of that is sunk around the telecom sector. So we we sink the entire cost, no matter where we are in the world, India, Mexico, around telecoms. And as you add on these new products, 
they sink directly to your bottom line because the infrastructure is paid for mm -hmm. already. Well, the railroad's there, to Correct. use the Buffett story. Uh, moving on to the, the hard numbers for a while, the income statement, this was for the six months to the end of November. Uh, you can see in there that the GP margin, 7.63, is slightly down on the last year, but nothing really to worry about. I guess the bottom line, the real number there, is that 284,000 headline earnings is against 246,000. We can, we can really get bogged down in the numbers, but the 15% growth is the, is the number, I guess, that people, if you want to get fixated on anything, that's the one to be fixated on. Is that where you pegging yourselves now into the future? Because it sounds like your kind of business model, 15% could become much higher if you turned off a few taps here and opened some elsewhere. So we're really excited about the future, Alec. I think we're in an industry which is really growing. The, the amount of products, you know, when we started, we had to wait for products to load onto our system. Now it's a matter of us choosing what we believe are the right products because there's just so many of them. From a distribution point of view, you know, we've got one of the most comprehensive distribution channels anywhere in the world if you compare us against absolutely anybody. So we're really excited from the margin that we're putting through you know, when we list in 2007, our GP margin was below 4%. It's now sitting over 7.5%. So the Can GP, it go much higher? As you add on new products, it will continue going because higher. Because they're coming in at, at a very high margin because you've got the railroad in place. And they're coming in at 100% margin almost. So it doesn't matter if we make 1%, 5%, or 10%. It's almost 100% because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Secondly... The barrier for entry in the independent world is much harder. When, when you're dealing in the formal world, it's much easier for people to compete. But the setup, I, I think, use the word, our, our model is simplistic and you're 100% right on it. But the actual methodology and the years and years it takes you to set up in an independent rural world is really our strength. And what really would it cost you to replicate? 150,000 points in South Africa alone wouldn't cost us less than we would be in for over one and a half billion rand and approximately five, six years to get to the same position. So if you had the one and a half billion elsewhere to put into that, it's still going to take you five to six years. So you can't, you, you can't find a competitor springing up tomorrow. No. Our, our competitors are different and we do have a lot of them, but they're more regional based. So what we find ourselves in is fighting in different regions and different products. So you'll take KwaZulu Natal and we'll have a very strong competitor who has called it two or 3,000 merchants in KwaZulu and does say only electricity and airtime. Not only, I don't mean only, but two mm -hmm. and we're constantly focused. Correct. And we, so we, we very seldomly fight on the whole basket of fruit and countrywide but regionally and product-wise, we fight all the time. All right. Well, we'll get into uh, acquisitive growth in a little while. Let's just look at the balance sheet now, which is looking pretty strong, excepting when you go through the, the cash number, the cash and cash equivalents. You've gone down a lot in the past year. And so uh, my apologies. Uh, yeah, there we go. 31st of May, 118 or 1.1, quarter 1.2 billion. That's against 388 million now. So if you have a look, we, we, we call it cash and cash equivalents, which is our stockholding. So for us, stockholding is exactly equivalent to cash. There's r really no difference. Any stock that we hold can literally be liquidated, and liquidated being the wrong word, but liquidated within days, two, three days. Turn into cash. Turn into cash at any time. So would that include airtime that you bought, say, from Vodacom? Absolutely. So what we do is we, we bulk purchase. This is uh, one of the things that we do to obviously improve our margins continuously. We hold stock because remember, our customers pay us cash before delivery. So they actually give us money. We open up these vaults. We don't know what they're going to pull out. Mm -hmm. And they pull out randomly. We've got to make sure we hold every single product 365 days of the year. Mm -hmm. But you do also have inventories there. So what's the difference between that cash and, and the inventories? So it's 1.8 billion of inventories. Correct. So we've transferred our money from cash into inventory, basically. So instead of, if you go back uh, the six months before, you will see that our inventory was sitting at about 1.2, 1.1 billion, mm -hmm. and you would have obviously our cash sitting at eight, nine hundred, a billion rand. So all you're seeing is a conversion from inventories into 
from cash into inventory, it's a direct line to look at each other. So if interest rates go up, theoretically that should help you. Absolutely. Then we're going to have to work out is it better to leave money in the bank or is it better to do our bulk buying, our early settlements. You know, when we listed our company, 55% of our profits came from interest received and we received over 12.5% in the bank. Today we receive on 6%, call it, and less than 5%. So our whole model of our business has changed entirely. Hmm. All right, let's, uh, but now strong balance sheet is, is very easy to see there. Of uh, course, really. Also in hmm. cash, we, we laid out about seven, 800 million rand last year as well in the acquisition of two acquisitions. Via Media and RMCS was about 500 million and dividends of just over 200 million. So also laid out seven, 800 million in cash. Yeah, we're going to talk about RMCS in uh, in a little while because that's quite a serious uh, uh, acquisition for you. But let's just go through the cash flows as well. Uh, the, the cash flow statement always you can you can not fiddle. I mean that's a little unfair, <laughs> um, but you can change the the numbers except in your balance sheet and your income statement. You can fiddle it around a little bit with headline earnings, but cash is cash. And as far as the cash is concerned. Um, the u cash utilized by operations in the past six months to, to November 2014 was in fact negative. Is there anything uh, that you can enlighten us on there? That was exactly a change in the inventory. So one very big bulk purchase that we did in that time period. The RMCS transaction took place, which was 314 million, which was a big one. Via Media, 150 million acquisition and dividends all in that six months. So, you know, this this business, one thing about it, it's a very cash generating business. We don't build assets like base mm -hmm. stations, for example. We start the month with one rand, we end the month on one rand fifty, and it's really expressed in cash. Okay, let's move on to that RMCS. So you've mentioned it a couple of times now. Your biggest acquisition to date? By far, it was a really big acquisition for us, 314 million rand which, uh, you know, for us took a lot of time, about two or three years, just by the way, for this deal from beginning to end. And really when we look at a deal, one is obviously it must be profit enhancing for the company, that goes without saying. But more importantly for us is the strategic fit of these businesses, what products and services we can put into the existing business, and of course what products and services we can take from their business and put into the rest of our businesses. You bought it in the 1st of April 2014, so they've been in the accounts for the full period to the end of November, the six months. Absolutely. What kind of contribution? So right bang on target, exact, actually a bit ahead of uh, what we expected and uh, we believe it will grow. This, this department or this division inside Blue Label, we believe into the future will be one of our biggest divisions. Why? It is entirely the back end of what we do in the retail section. So this is not for independence, this is more for the formal retail. And what they offer is great products and services which sit in the back end where traditionally we are the technology in the middle and call it the front end. We now can offer a lot of products and services from the back end call center technology side that sits in the, call it the platform on the back end. Like what? So for example, we can offer, which is really going to be, be a big one for us, money transfers. So we could go to the likes of, um, and I'm just using it purely as an example, but you can go to the likes of say a spa and you can give them a whole solution white label from beginning to end to do money transfers. Obviously you'll always need the bank, so it's not a banking license at all, but you can drop a product into spa and say from tomorrow you can transfer money to and from a spa, but more importantly we want to become the first aggregator which moves outside of a closed environment. So when you go now to a spa or to a shop right or to a PEP, money transfers is limited to the environment that you go in and for all the right reasons because if they can limit it to the environment, more feet into the store, more products are all done for the right reason. Mm -hmm. In our world, what we want to do is we want to say to you, and if you want to walk into a spa, go put your money into a spa and take it out of a out of the shop corner, right. out of a shop right, out of a corner cabinet, out of a bank. And once we can open loop this, money transfers will become very interesting. It it will indeed, but we have Mpesa. How does how is it different to that? 
So PEARS is a great example because we are neutral aggregators, so we, we really don't mind what it looks like. It can look like an MPEZ, it can look like a white label product. What we want to do or what we want to be is we want to be the cash in and cash out outlet and this is the very, this actually summarizes. So if, if I'm from Ngutu in KZN, which is fairly rural, and I have a brother who's in Johannesburg, and he would like to send me 200 rand. The ideal here would be he could go into a spa, deposit the 200 rand, and I would be able to pick it up in how? How in, in the area that I live in? So we would say to you, you can go to any one of our informal retailers. So you can go to... So it could be the local spaza shop. can be any of the spas, well, 130,000 mm -hmm. of them are around the country. There would be a few in Mortu, I'm sure. Correct. Or if you prefer to go for argument's sake, not that this is a bit into a shop right or spa. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give you the option of many options. I know that sounds a bit silly, but we don't want to limit you to only walk into X and do it because once you limit someone, you, you obviously limit the capacity for growth. What we're going to offer the impairs and all of them is mass cash in and cash out outlets so that what you have to do as Vodacom is make sure your brand's out there. That Whoever wants money transfers goes for M-Pesa. What we'll do is we the walk test. No matter where you walk in this country, you'll be able to do cash in and cash. And this is made possible by that RMCS acquisition? RMCS is one part of it, which is just technology, which is money transfer. Mm -hmm. And the, the second part of it, which is actually the main part of Blue Label, which is the distribution channel. So really what we're doing is in our acquisitions, we're now just trying to pick up strategically the different components that complete the full circle for us. Mm -hmm. My apologies, I should have taken those phones off the hook before we started. Also on this uh, on the <laughs> slide though, which is really uh, uh, very instructive, is the way that your different shares have uh, of the cell phone companies have been changing. November 2013, you were at 50% uh, of Vodacom, it stayed the same all the way through. but. Cell C has gone up 17, 19, 21 percent, whereas MTN's share 32 percent, 29 percent, 27 percent. So the difference for you has been, and telecom is kind of a very, very small slug there. Uh, if one has a look at that graph, the, the black graph, the Cell C graph has been growing. The yellow one, the MTN graph, as or share of the pie has been falling. Why is that? So first of all, just to put it out there, this is obviously what's happening inside Blue Label. It's not the market itself, it's really the share what's happening inside us. And I guess it's a, it's a relationship with suppliers. With, uh, with but it's also reflective of the marketplace. We know that MTN have uh, sw uh, changed their South African CEO not too long ago. Uh, this would be consistent with with perhaps your experience. So I think you're right. I think in the past it was definitely reflective. I think in fairness to MTN is they've changed their CEO and they've changed a lot of things they're doing and I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't uh, write them off just yet. I think they're coming back hard and I think uh, they're going to give us uh, a big run for their money. In fact, I think if we're sitting 12 months from now and looking at this pie chart again, I have no doubt that there's going to there's not going to be one number that's the same. I but think what's going so on? Much change. Cell C though, in your case, has been growing very, very strongly. I think Celsius, what they did is with their 99 cents and they led it, is they became the consumer champion. If 99 cents was the right amount or not the right, let's put a pin in that. But I think really what they did is they went out there. What networks generally did in the past is we weren't exactly sure what we paid or what we didn't pay, rightfully or wrongfully, so just the way they marketed it. Celsius came out 99 cents, almost became uh, the consumer champion for for the consumer out there and I think took a lot of market share, definitely took a lot of market share. The question really now uh, is where is CELC takes it from now. Mm -hmm. You know also a great CEO there just to really put it out there, Jose is a, he's a, I like to call him a street fighter which means CELC were coming from the streets at the bottom. They're going to put up a very good fight and they're going to if anything, I can tell you one, the consumer is winning absolutely at the moment. We know the consumer is winning, but we also know that Saudi Asia, the owners of Salsi, have appointed Goldman Sachs to try and find a solution okay. to this never-ending cash that they're throwing at the company. 
How are you reading that? So I think, uh, sure, uh, straightforward. I think the networks, Vodacom and MTN, need Cell C to remain in the form it is actually and let Cell C have its market share in peace. And the reason why I say that is, you know, I guess the last thing that South African networks want is for a overseas, call it a Chinese telecom or India, not saying they'll win or lose, but Korean, mm -hmm. Korea and come into this country and then all of a sudden we're not at 99 cents because they used to be in a 10 cents a minute mm -hmm. and then this whole thing is on its head. So I think for the consumer and for Vodacom and MTN and for Celsi, I think if it can sort of stay in the same format it is, so maybe Celsi is looking to sell off a piece. I, I, I'm not convinced that they're trying to sell off all of it. I think Celsi's come a long way from 24 months ago, and I think it's got a lot to offer, so we'll see how this plays out. What about for Blue Label, to be very specific here, with the decline in the per minute charges, the way that Celsi's ch churned up the market, has that been bad for you, given that if you're selling something that's worth two rand, uh, and it's now the same thing as worth 50 cents, your margin must be squeezed. So we work on ARPU, which is total spend. So currently, the average prepaid user uses about 70 rand. So if you go back a year ago for a 70 rand, for argument's sake, they could make 50 phone calls a month. Now for their 70 rand, they can make 70 phone calls. So we're not affected at all yet. When we will be affected, and I'm not sure if we'll see it soon or in our lifetime, is if one of our consumers can spend 40 rand and talk as much as they want because they work on a RAND spend where they, they're not getting as much talk for their RAND yet. So does it happen one day that the networks come out and say, okay, voice, 40 RAND, talk the whole month? We'll definitely be affected. But mm. negatively. 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 For now, we're not affected at all. In fact, what you see, because they can spend a little bit more, you actually see in the bottom end, ARPU's increased slightly because now they can make 120 phone calls instead of 70 and now they'll spend 73 rand instead of 70 rand. So you actually see a, a bit of a positive uptake in the bottom end, but obviously on the top end for you and I, you know, in the postpaid world, which we don't do, our bills have halved mm -hmm. and we're still talking as much as we want and I think this is where the real effect for the networks is coming through. Is data finding its way into the bottom end? Absolutely and in quickly, but what will really spur this on is you've already seen a smartphone at about four ninety nine, five, six hundred Rand. They say now they're gonna launch smartphones at like three, four hundred Rand and subsidize them down. So as you get these smartphones cheaper and lower in so you'll see our normal traditional phone in the next twenty four months will probably be finished, obsolete, and it'll be replaced entirely by a smartphone and then you're gonna see data. I don't think data can ever take over voice because voice is just so massive. So it is compensating the growth data, not to the limit they're losing on voice, but you're seeing this massive uptake everywhere on data. So it's a new product for you? It's a brand new product. You've seen the networks launching these data bundles, which is great for us, great for our customers, where we can now sell data as a recharge voucher. So now it's not our normal voice vouchers, it's not data. So data for us is total upside. How, how big might it be? data in your in your uh, in your universe so I'll only explain it to you uh, Eleanor Craig senior once explained it to me which I thought was just a great explanation he said in the voice world eventually you get tired of talking and you put down the phone in the data world you can surf as long as you want for as many hours you won't get to one millionth of what you can do so the size of the data world compared to the voice world is a thousand times, a millionth or whatever it is times bigger. In our world what you're hoping for is all phones are replaced by smartphones, you get to a place where voice is a set price and all the rest is data. So I think it will happen, I do not think it is happening, it's a matter of how soon it happens and where it settles. For us I think what ultimately happens is for 90 percent of our customers they have X amount of money call it just seven rand. Across the world you're looking at between six and eight dollars, which is about the RP across the world. And it settles there and if it all gets consumed by voice, all gets consumed by data, whichever one it does, that's where it's gonna stick. Hmm. Well that's one of the big bull points. Another 
huge one potentially for you is prepaid electricity. You don't have to tell anyone in South Africa how this market is exploding. Uh, lots of people still not paying for electricity at the moment, but the municipalities are trying to change that. And then you guys come into the picture. Sure, this one, you know, when we, when we started this four and a half years ago, our revenue in our first year was three million rand. Our revenue for the half year was 5.3 billion. So you're looking at going from three million to 11 billion in five years, which is, it shows you that when you plug the right, right product into our machine, the growth is abnormal. And I'll, we'll go through other products because electricity is not the last. There's more coming like electricity. What's great about electricity is they, the country sits on about 9 million meters. Government has stated clearly that in the next five years they want to get to 18 million meters. We all know that there's massive collection bill, uh, problems across the country. It doesn't matter which municipality. Everyone is converting into prepaid and not even the collection. We as consumers, you know, we want much more control. We know that in the city there's a lot of billing problems. So there's problems all over that can be solved automatically with prepaid. The cost is the same. So there's no problem. You can manage it very easily. It's, you can get an SMS when your electricity is down. You can buy it via the Internet. You don't have to do it prepaid. So the control of it in the Western Cape, it doesn't matter if you buy a house for 100,000 Rand or 50 million Rand. You don't even get an option anymore in some areas. It comes with prepaid straight away. So you're going to see this explosion. Where are we in the cycle? I don't even think we're halfway. I think it, we're just beginning and it's really going to, the growth, 18% for us for the six months, 20% last year, 33% the year before. You, you're really going to just see this thing growing in high double digits for the next four, five, six years for sure. When you say in the Western Cape, you don't even get an option in certain areas. Do you have the option now in, in the commercial heartland in Johannesburg to, to go prepaid rather than uh, the, being billed every month? Not in all areas, but in a lot of areas we do. Um, I suggest to listeners or to people to check whether you can or can't, but you'll find that in most areas in the heartland of Joburg you can already replace it. And how big a share of this market do you have? So this is a hard one to tell because it's broken up into about 276 municipalities of which ESCOM's about 50% and then the other call it 275 or the other 50% so it's impossible to get individual stats from it. But I would imagine that we sit at around about 40%. 40 That's your market share. As our market share so the opportunity for us here is obviously immense and mm. the growth here is great for us. What about other uh, utilities? Water, an obvious one. So the next big one that's coming which is exactly alongside electricity is water. Whereas every household that has electricity, we take for granted, will have to have water. So if there's 18 million electricity meters, there's definitely going to be 18 million water meters. We're already in trial periods with a lot of municipalities, so we've already started trialing. We, we're already doing a couple of million a month, so the uptake much quicker, obviously, than electricity when we started. And it's one to watch for the future. There's obviously constitutional laws that there's a certain amount of water that has to be given for free to each household, which will obviously be governed by, by councils and by municipalities, which is important for us, by the way. We don't tariff. So we don't decide on electricity bills or electricity amounts. We really merely just a distribution mm -hmm. arm of how it works. So water's coming. I think it's going to come rapidly. And if it took us four or five years to get here on electricity, from the same time period, we reckon it will be half on water. It will take us two or three years. The key point here is, again, going back to that rail, railroad metaphor, you've got the distribution outlets in, in place and you could roll it out quite quickly. I suppose the, the, the alternative has to be, what about online? What about if uh, Google decides to go into your field? Is that not a vulnerability? So first of all, just to put it out there, you know, the margins that we keep at the end of the day are like one, one and a half percent. You know, the majority of the margins which kept by the merchants, which is still not massive, it's three, four, five percent. So anyone who wants to compete with us in water and wants to roll out a device just for water, can you imagine rolling out this whole device and saying I'm going to make one percent of water? You're going to go bankrupt in the first six months. It doesn't work. So this add-on of this railway definitely works. Yeah, online will exist. The two problems with online is, number one, people don't do credit sales on online. So everything on online has to be via EFT and has to be cash, so obviously limiting the risk. 
we supply a lot of un online people because you might be Google online, you've got a choice, come to Blue Label, let Blue Label make it to mere 1% and we link you into 276 municipalities, 400 water places, so on and so forth, ticketing, or do you really want to go and link into every single municipality, every single telco to take away the 1% that mm -hmm. I'm making? It will probably cost you more. So when you actually break it down eventually and see what we keep, we, we have very different conversations with networks and with them. I think everyone's content with what we make. We do all the R&D, we do all the hard work, the salespeople, the distribution, and in the end we keep our 1 or 2% per product. Because you've got, you've got scale. Correct. Mm. Moving offshore now, India, um, there was a, a, all that famous story that if you can send, sell a, one can of Coke to everybody in China, or for that matter in India, uh, you'd obviously never have to work again. Uh, a similar story here, you, you went, you've been in India for a while now. We had our 10 year anniversary last year, February, and uh, really an interesting time. I know people say 10 years, but we finally turned the hockey stick in India. India is becoming very exciting for us. You know, we showed a loss of 700,000 Rand for the half year, but it was more IFRS adjustment. We're trading profit. We, we're profitable now. And, you know, once you turn this hockey stick, it becomes very interesting. What's really interesting is we found our electricity in India, which is money transfers. So we did the same thing, built our distribution and the telcos. The margin there is crazy, I mean, what they charge. But, you know, we've been, we're the number one wallet like M-Pesa, we compete with the M-Pesa Vodafone in India, we, we're bigger than them. We we up to like three million dollars, a hundred million dollars a month already in money transfers. This is a potential market of about a hundred billion dollars a year. Seventy billion being cross-border. So you've already got the money transfers working in India, yeah. it shouldn't be too difficult to plug it back in at home. No, we've got it. So obviously different countries vary because the legality of cross-border or local, you know, a lot of countries have got a problem with cash in, a lot of countries cash out depending. So your barrier for entry, first of all, is the legality, especially if it's cross-border. But how big is your railroad in India? How many distribution outlets do you have there? Almost exactly the same as South Africa, about 150, just over 150,000 as well. India, though, the potential for this railroad is immense. And the competition must be more The intense. competition is much more, much more intense. Quite strangely enough, in our world, once again in India, we haven't come up against the globular competition. Once again, individual. In this money transfer space, I can tell you the competition is going to be rough and is going to be obviously immense. We're ready for it. We, you know, Oxygen India, which is our company, is leading it entirely. We, we've applied to become our own, it's like a, it's a money transfer bank, it's a, like a, a mini bank in India now. So a lot of positive things coming out of India and, and looking really good for us. How often do you, do you visit? So Mark and I used to go really often, like five or six times a year. We now try to go between us three or four times a year. And your management team there? Our management team once a, once a month, either not either in India and Mexico, depending who either from a sales, mm -hmm. from a technical. But we we almost in every country, every other Mexico, India once a month. And you mentioned Mexico. Let's move on to that one now. Uh, how long have you been operating there for? So yeah, we've been operating for just on five years, five six years, but five years. Taking a bit longer, losing a little bit more than we anticipated. The vision and the strategy exactly the same as South Africa and India have built this distribution channel. You know, unfortunately, we haven't found our second line there, like uh, money transfers or electricity. It will come, though. So, yeah, we lost an additional 15 million rand in Mexico for the six months. We ended up, our share, losing 45 million rand. But right on strategy, you know, it is taking us a bit longer. We have had a lot more pressure. You see, the problem there on the telcos is 70% is dominated by one network. Carlos yeah. Slim. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> is he not getting competition now? And there's a big change in competition started in January of this year. You know, I think AT&T has bought two of the smaller 
uh, telcos, they look like they're going to own 12 percent. The government ECASA, the similarity, have put big laws on the interconnector that they have to take down the market share to under 50 percent. So all these things are really good for us. You know, you've got to believe in the vision of what we do. You've got to believe in the strategy of building this distribution. And the product will come. I, I know I'm making it sound easy, but every single product and service in the world if it can, will be offered in a prepaid mechanism. It doesn't mean it will be only, it will be offered. And I can assure you, every human being on planet Earth, I can tell you, is going to transact in at least one mm -hmm. prepaid mechanism. So and it really does, and they don't even realize it. So when you're in America, you say to them, you're going to be on prepaid. They say, never. You say, OK, let's start with a simple one. Do you have a Easter card? Yeah, yeah, of course. That's a metro. I put my $100 in at the beginning of the month. I can go on any train. That's prepaid. That's, yeah, like the You card, buy yeah. iTunes card. Yep, that's prepaid. Seventy-six thousand outlets in Mexico. In correct. Mexico, and what's the potential there? Hundreds of. Th I mean, our partner there is a company called Grupo Bimbo, massive, little, biggest bakery in the world. Just a little stat on them: seventeen to nineteen thousand trucks in Mexico alone. They call on seven hundred fifty thousand outlets a day. So we have a partner there that's just unbelievable. A great partner as people as well as a company and potential with them they 19 Latin American countries so Mexico for us is a start it's not uh, it's definitely not the only one and how long have you been with Grupo Bimba for five years all right so you're getting to know each other pretty well we're now. getting to know each other and just to close off with the prospects uh, blue labels prospects we've we've spoken briefly about oxygen India ticket pro we haven't touched on that yet this is our next one this is a, a big category ticketing. It fits into three different parts of ticketing. You game ticketing, so typically you call it rugby cricket. Transport ticketing, call it bus, train. And then event ticketing. So under those three categories, if you break it down further, ticketing is a very, very big All category. prepaid again. Absolutely prepaid. We've got a company called Ticket Pros. I mean, the, the name that most South Africans know is CompuTicket in South Africa. There's definitely a place for a CompuTicket and a Ticket Pros. Once again, why is Blue Label going to play a part in this? Well, one, because we have thousands of outlets that will offer ticketing, whereas now, generally, if you want ticketing, you would have to go to a CompuTicket, which is found generally in a shop right, and there's lots of them, six, seven hundred, so there's no shortage of them. But if we can open this up to four, five thousand, not limit you to a shop right because there's not one in your area. So say to you, we'll give you shop right as well because we're happy to obviously supply shop right, but give you much more, much more option of where to go. And then of course change ticketing, and this is the major thing. Right now, when you go see a game or whatever, you buy an elongated ticket, you go to the game, no one absolutely knows who you are. We want to change it into a card-based ticketing system under NFC, where it's tap and go. The only difference now is we understand you. So you'll have one card for doesn't matter what ticketing it is from train, bus, event, one direction, or or going to see a rugby game. The only difference is the next time you click on to go into a Blue Bulls, we say, Alec, thank you. We've seen you've come to three out of the last nine games. Do you want, some, do you want to buy some horns? How would you mm -hmm. like to go? We're giving you 10% off horns. Go there. And what it becomes <laughs> is it really just becomes a loyalty. I can see that. <clears throat> Uh, then you'll be selling lots of horns to those, <laughs> uh, those guys at, at Loftus into the future. Uh, generally speaking, and it's it's quite nicely articulated in in what we've been discussing and on this uh, this card here. But in every business, you have to be aware of where your threats are, where your competitors lurk. In in Blue Label's case, it's a, you've made a compelling story, and and many investors like to just find the right long-term trend, get aboard and let it ride. But where's, where's, what keeps you awake at night? What should concern those people who are buying your shares today? So the first thing that really keeps me up at night is people. I think, uh, you know, we've got to control growth of Blue Label. We've got to control resource of Blue Label that we don't find ourselves spread out too thin, too wide and make uh, fundamental mistakes that we just don't need to make. And of course, as you grow, to find the right expertise in different areas, you know, as specialists. When we started, 
uh, we, we were specialists in everything. Now, when we launch ticketing, we get a specialist who just understands ticketing. Mm -hmm. He lives and breathes it. So the first thing for me is people, and it's something that really I watch consistently, especially personally. Then, of course, you've got the networks. You know, you, you've got to give the reason to networks and to municipal, we'll call it the big guys, not just mm -hmm. networks. You've got to give them reason to survive forever. You've got to, you've got to give them reason for, for needing you and wanting you. And then, of course, our competition is large because we're playing in such a large space. Our competition is not, you know, no one to sneeze at. You know, if it's ticketing, we're up against shop mm. and compute ticket, you know. Deep pockets, deep big resources, pockets, clever people. Brett, so. we've got piles of questions that have come in here, so I'm going to start throwing a few at you, and let's try and see how many we can get through. What is sustainability of the business model given advances in tech and as more people move from unbanked to banked? So that's a sustainability model entirely for us, you know. For us, the more bank they become, it's this whole thing about the World Bank. You, the, you're going to only have X amount of bank branches. You're not going to see more bank branches. It's who can bank these un, underbank people in a different banking mechanism, and that's what we do. We're going to send you to one of our merchants, to one of our spas, if just call it that. We're going to make sure that you can bank because if and B for argument's sake, say got a thousand banks, they can't roll out ten thousand banks. They're gonna use us to go further and deeper. So the more people get banked, the better for us. We wanna be, as I always say, the cash in and cash out continuously. Robert wants to know if your retailers are holding stock uh, then as they sell and what you supply. Wants to know if your retailers are holding stock as they sell on, uh, what do you supply? So different models, you'll have some retailers who actually physically hold stock mm -hmm. and then you'll have certain retailers that work in this cloud. So they hold zero stock. First customer comes in and says, oh, can I have a bus ticket? Hits something on his tilt, out comes a bus ticket. Next one says Vodacom, out comes. So we hold 100% of the stock and then they just pull down what they require. So they don't actually need to hold, as you said earlier, zero stock. Be specific now. This question is who are your competitors, local and global? So, fortunately in Mexico, you know, we're one of the very few are doing what we're doing. So, in a virtual world, we, we haven't come up against competition yet. In India, our competition is the likes of Impesta, Vodafone. So, our competition on the telcos has died down. Our real competition is coming from the money transfer world, which is all the banks and all the networks. So, real competition in India, but find ourselves positioned really nicely there. In South Africa, our competition is very similar. You know, we, we're competing against the banks, um, we're competing against the networks, we're competing against the chain stores. You know, the chain stores in this country are extremely powerful in what we do. And of course, the banking from the likes of Corded, like a FNB, who is playing a very big space and giving you a tablet if you buy data from them. So our competition exists everywhere. I think competition is good and it's not coming from an ignorant or naive point of view. We like competition, it keeps us uh, very focused, and we, we come from a different place entirely, you know, we working from very rural out, moving ourselves in. Everyone who we compete with is moving from in, moving out, and it sounds subtle, but it's a massive difference. Brian asks, how do you market machines to rural markets? We have one of the most comprehensive sales forces, we believe, in South Africa. It's called a foot soldier model, of which we have over 200 trucks and about 6,000 foot soldiers that uh, continuously work for us. And what they do is they're on the streets, they're educating the average sale that we can do with a person is between one and eight minutes, so a lot more time. We see four and a half million individuals on a monthly basis, and this is one of the massive futures for Blue Label. For us to add on products and now to sell financial services or banking products, this is really, we, 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 we're dealing in South Africa on the streets and we're dealing with people and the opportunity for us to sell you is immense. Talk on multi-links, what's the real story there? No real story other than it's behind us, you know. We, we fought, uh, so the telecom obviously for many years, spent a lot of money fighting and really you know, with the new management of Telcom, we were eventually able to all sit around the table. It was pretty hard before this management came. They had a lot of change of management. There was no one for us to sit. 
And I guess in November, December decided we need to move on. You know, we've got so many good things going for us. We we really do. We don't know how long this case will be, another four, five, however many years. You know, we sat around the table with them and we agreed to move on. They moved on their way, we moved on our way. And most importantly, see what we can do with them in the future and see what we can make from each other doing good business rather than being in this endless battle that we all know who makes the money. <laughs> The lawyers. <laughs> Moving on back to your financial statement, Rodney wants to know about joint losses referred to in your financial statements. What are those? Joint losses would be from, so when you talk about India. Share of losses from joint ventures. Correct. Mm -hmm. So when you look at our associates, in, we bring in India and Mexico and you cash as an associate. We don't bring them on a revenue line or consolidate them. So when you look at it, you're looking at the consolidated number of our Mexico losses, our India losses of profits, and of course our UK profits. All right, so going up from 33 million to 49 million, those losses, is not an area of concern for you at this point. That's uh, within within budget. That's the 15 million extra we lost to Mexico, basically. Okay. Uh, Alan D asks, why Mexico? I think you've spoken about it a lot, but maybe you want to add? So, very interestingly, when Microsoft found us in 2007, the two people in Mar Microsoft were Mexican by origin. And when, after we did the deal with Microsoft's consent, they came to us and said, we love what you do. Do you mind if we roll this out in Mexico? We said, well, that will be great. Obviously, 120, 150, 180 million people, a great market for us, plus a corridor between America for money transfers, which is massive, and set up with them. After we set up with them. We then did a deal. We did a deal in South Africa with Premier Foods in 2006, 7 So we understood how very powerful the distribution channel of bread is. Found the bread people being Group Bimbo, and that's how it all came together for us. There's a question here about the balance sheet. Why are intangible net assets and goodwill so high? How do you break them down? This is from Robert DeForce. Robert, we're going to have to put a pin in that because it's. Uh, it goes into a bit of detail, but I'm more than happy if you want to contact us for us to give you more detail. 1.3 billion from a billion, so it's Correct. okay. All right, Robert, I hope you... It's you got know. to do just, by the way, with our starter pack bases and how we bring in the intangibles of our connections of our starter packs as well as the bases we bought play a massive part in this. All right, we're coming to the end now, but there are a few more questions I'd love to take. Elaborate on settlement risk from a timing point of view as there thousands of small outlets. Is it instantaneous? What does that mean, sir? Well, when somebody, when one of the small outlets taps into your back end okay. and sells the product, does it go straight into your bank account? Correct. So we take zero risk. It actually works on a cash before delivery basis, which means you have to sit in a credit balance in order to transact. Uh -huh. So it doesn't. So they prepay you, you too. Correct. Hmm. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I can understand that. No, and then, no. is there interest deeper into Africa? Not at the moment. You know, we have had our experience in Mozambique, very good, sold that off to our partner. We are then in the DRC, which we were doing really nicely, but became very difficult for us to operate there, and actually gave up the DRC to operate in Algeria, which of course ended in the multi-links problem. But we got our hands tied with South Africa, India, and Mexico, and we got a group of Bimbo who has these 17 or 19 mm -hmm. bakeries across Latin America that if we're going to do anything, we're going to follow them. They really would like to roll out more. You, you're talking about a massive business. We want to get Mexico right, and then we can roll it out tremendously. So unless something really comes across in Africa, no. Final question. Uh, if Bitcoin goes mainstream, or an equivalent to bit, uh, Bitcoin, how would this affect your business? Another product for us to sell. So we don't mind if it's a Bitcoin. We don't mind if it's... We, doesn't matter what the, the voucher looks like. What we would do is we would dispense this Bitcoin. We'd give you an ability to buy it and where to cash it in. So bring on Bitcoin. We'd love that product. Brett Levy, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you very much for, for coming through to our studio, for uh, uh, talking to the team at the, well, the Standard Bank uh, on Unshare Trading uh, clients. It's been a lot of fun. I know you usually have your, your, other, uh, your other partner. Interesting. You and Standard Bank, the only listed companies I know that have got joint CEOs. Must be something in that, eh? You see? <laughs> but I guess it's easier for, for you than Sim and Ben. From your perspective, you've you kind of grown up together. We you? just want to be a mini-me of Standard Bank. 
Yeah, I guess everybody wants to be. But uh, Brett Levy, thank you. And I think on behalf of everybody who joined us today and who will be watching this, thanks for being so open and, uh, thank you. and discussing it with us. Well, going back to Stuart at Standard Bank HQ. Thanks, Stuart. Lots of interesting questions. Uh, fascinating insights from Brett Levy. Look forward to our next one. Thanks, Alex. Cheers. Goodbye, everyone.